Let us honor our king. Blessed are the people who know the sound of the shofar. In the light of your countenance, O Yahweh, shall they walk. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Ashir kitsiyanu v'mitzato v'tzivanu lishmoa kol shofar. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to hear the voice of the shofar.
That is always awesome. That is always beautiful. Tells the story in a dramatic way, doesn't it? Amen. So we have a double celebration today. So we say Shabbat Shalom and Hak Sameach Matzah. Today's the first day of Unleavened Bread. So we are, we are now officially out of the Exodus. I mean, delivered from right. Egypt, delivered from the bondages of sin. I love what Bill Cloud's uh, theme is for his weekend. It's uh, from bondage to bond servants. And Amen. that's what we are, no Amen. longer in bondage. Amen. If Amen. we're in Messiah. Amen. And then uh, Jennifer got me a little matzah going Woo-hoo! on on top of the head, <laughs> a little matzah keeper. <laughs> so, so I'm under the unleavened bread banner today. Amen. So I told her, she mean got you're it. Sinless, I just, right? I hope so. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so anyway, um, we just want to welcome everybody here on this this awesome Amen. first day of unleavened bread. And hope you all had a great Passover, whether we you were with us or at your home that uh, truly Yeshua met us there and got to witness uh, through it. So the Father is so good. Amen. 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 But I did want to share with those who did a home uh, Seder last night a word that I was given for our community for starting out for this year. The feast cycle is from Revelation 21, 4 and 5. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. So as I shared last night, though we know the context of the original writing of that, it's just a word spiritually for us to understand that he, he was and is and is to come. So we can apply those words spiritually to our lives. Amen. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. They ha you ha debrim ha ele a share no key miss of kahayoma live of echo Veshin on tom live an echo Betty Barto bomb but sheep to cub of a techo who black to cover Derek who shock be call who be come echo who shot tom lay all down your deco They ha you the total foot bain in echo who tough tom el messes old bet echo you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. 
You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Do not be anxious. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your wife, what you eat or what you drink, or what, nor about your body, what you put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor nor get into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can a single hour to the span of life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory is not really like one of these. But God, but God shall clothe the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. So he not much clothe, much more than clothe you. Oh, if you have little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat or what shall I drink? <laughs> For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and the, in your heavenly power, you know that you need them all. So seek first, seek, seek, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteous, righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about your about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be, will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That is amazing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. Amen. Okay, Piper. Abba. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. To see your, to receive your truth. To receive your truth. In Yeshua's name. In Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 And let's all point our hands and say, by his grace, not one will be lost. Amen.
going to get ready and do a presentation. It's called Believe for It. And there again, this is what this season is about. That we are believing, every one of us in here have different needs in our life, whether they're spiritual, physical, psychological, whatever it may be. But whatever it is, is I always like to believe that in these presents that we bring before our Heavenly Father, that there's not just something that they're doing for us just to look at and say how great they are. But I believe it's a, yeah, it is an aroma. It is an aroma, and, it is, and I believe it's prophetic. I like to see that whatever they're doing is speaking forth to the nations for them to hear outside of these walls. These walls, I mean, they're something for us, but it's nothing for the Holy Spirit. There are no walls. He's not bound by walls. And I just pray that the very voices of what they do and how the praise and worship and all of that just goes out, that it ministers to this town, it ministers to this community, it ministers to our, our nation, and not only this, for the nations around the world. So whatever you need to believe for, believe for it and receive it. You don't have to walk up here to get it. Faith is receiving and walking in at the moment that it comes to you and you grab it. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. together 
You shall say before Yahweh your Elohim, I have removed the sacred portion from my house and also have given it to the Levi and the alien, the orphan and the widow, according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of Yahweh my Elohim. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the ground which you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey as you swore to our fathers. Amen. Amen. Barakud Adonai, humble rock. Baruch Adonai, humble rock, leolam ba'ed. Baruch Adonai, humble rock, leolam ba'ed. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Asher b'kah b'nu mikol ha'amim. Benatan l'nu etorato. Baruch Atah Adonai, noten ha'torah. Amen. Bless Yahweh the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Yah, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen and amen. Y'all may be seated. I want you guys to go to Exodus 29, verses 1 and 2. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to read Genesis 2, 8. Y'all don't have to go there. Y'all just trust me. But what I wanted to do today is because this is the first day of unleavened bread. We talked about last night in part of the service, unleavened bread, when we held it up, you saw that it was bruised where the burn marks were. Bruised, we saw the stripes and we saw the holes in it where it's pierced. I want to talk about that today about suffering for righteousness but not suffering because of judgment. Amen? And I thought about something about unleavened bread. A lot of times, for people like me, because I'm not a cook, you know what I'm saying? But thinking about it, there's something besides just unleavened bread. What are the ingredients that go in it? And one of the ingredients that goes in it is oil. Olive oil goes into it. And then when I'm going to read in here in just a moment about also whenever they would bring these grain offerings, it had to be unleavened bread mixed with oil, but they would have frankincense on it also. And I was sitting there thinking about unleavened bread, oil, and then Rose Kodesh was talking about how we need to be a sweet fragrance, like it talked about in the Song of Songs chapter 2 where it's like where the figs are ripened and the vine, the grapes on the vines are blooming and blossoming, it gives off a sweet aroma. And remember we talked about when we are around people, do we stinketh? You know, or what do we smell like? What are we putting off? What is our attitudes? What's happening with our very being? Because we're not to, because we see all of these examples in the Scripture about if we're to be a light set on a hill... We're not to put our light under a bushel. That we're, so you see that we're supposed to be out there. I can't help what other people are looking for. Hidden under a bush that little chickens lay. I can't help that. But the Father knows how to do what He needs to do in the times and seasons. So we can be a light where we need to be. Amen? So with that said, I just want to also, I'm going to talk a little bit about this about a garden, all right, so we got a garden, we got unleavened bread, we got oil, we got fragrance, and how what Yeshua shows forth all of them is the way we're also are supposed to show forth these areas, so before I get to Exodus 29, it says in Genesis 2, 8, it says, and Yahweh Elohim planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and it says, and there he put the man Whom he has formed. Now, yes. Oh, there's salt. There's salt in there too. That's right. Salt's in there. There's other ingredients, but the salt is part of it too. That's right. So, as we see this, is I wanted you to see here that Yahweh planted a garden. We know it's the Garden of Eden. And he put a man there. 
Now, at the very end of this story, we're going to see this about a garden again that shows up. That in the very garden, and we know this, is where Adam sinned. He didn't sin outside of the garden. He sinned in the garden. By sinning in the garden, he got kicked out of the garden. But we're supposed to be now what? Returning to that garden. And there's a process. That's why it just hit me last night. One degree at a time or this week, this, this cycle, one degree, every cycle, every Shabbat, every Shabbat we move a degree. We don't, and here's what's so sad. What's so sad to me is, is when, is, let me just put it this way. Passover and Sukkot is very important to me. They're very serious. I just want, in part of guarding and keeping, now I want to make this, you know, for like our brother Tom back there and brother Herman and some of them who are battling sickness and battling through some physical areas of their life. I understand that. And I'm not talking to them. I'm talking about well-abled, healthy bodies. We're not going to treat Passover and Sukkot like the Christians do Christmas and Easter. That ain't going to happen. Amen. And so uh, I'll get in your Kool-Aid. Hope you got a good flavor because we're going to put out a fragrance. And I'm just, I, this is important because to move one degree to the next, it don't start at Passover and end at Sukkot. It starts at Shabbat. It starts at Shabbat. It starts every week. And because every Shabbat, every Shabbat that we had from last Sukkot built up to this Pesach. And every Shabbat will lead up to Shavuot, and every Shabbat will lead up to uh, Sukkot. That's just the way it happens, because those degrees are very important. Anybody in here that's a mechanic will tell you, where's Roger Rogers? Raise that hand. There you go. He'll tell you about degrees in timing in a vehicle. Do degrees matter? Absolutely, they matter. You ever hear something backfire? Yo, detonate. There's an explosion that happens when things are not in timing. And so what I'm saying is, is that the Father is moving His people a degree. We need to be in step with Him. If we're not, then we're in a retard situation. We're behind. And if you're out of timing, you're not going to fire right. And the next thing you know, we're going to be spitting and sputtering through life. Because He's not stopping. He's on a move. His Torah, His Holy Spirit is moving. We got, and you know what? At least through repentance, we can advance timing. Sometimes we can advance timing. Sometimes through that, He can bring us to where we need to be because we were just in the flesh too long. Amen? So think about this. So He put a man in a garden. All right, so now let's go to Exodus 29, 1 and 2. It says, Are we a kingdom of priests? Everybody say yes. Whether you know it or not, just believe me. We're a kingdom of priests. Now this is what you shall do to consecrate them. So there's consecration. Every time that Yahweh got ready to do something, whether it's priests, whether it was to bring Israel to the mountain, whatever, there was always consecration. When we come into these feasts, this is what we concentrate on is to be consecrated. Before we took the third cup last night, we're talking about being consecrated and ready to take that cup. So that we don't take that cup. Because like I said, it's, it's one thing. Guys, we, we, will, I, I, we can embrace suffering for righteousness. We can embrace that. Don't be afraid of that. Suffering for righteousness is a wonderful, blessed thing. Because we can grow in that. Y'all don't have to frown because I said suffering. But suffering for righteousness is going to bring forth a dynamic great reward. But what is happening is, is most of the time when people suffer, they're suffering because of judgment. And there's a huge difference there. You know, the Washington Post put out an article yesterday, and it came out, I guess, yesterday or today. I read it this morning or, or last night. It says, that this is a Jewish journalist, and he said, we need to get God out of this country. He said, because God, with God, there's nothing but suffering and turmoil and just misery. And I'm like, dude, lost it. <sighs> People like that need to get struck. But let me tell you something. What brings judgment? Yeah. Disobedience. 
See, he wants to walk in disobedience. Do you think getting rid of God, do you think getting rid of Yahweh is going to fix your problem? No. Ask the people at Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what I'm saying? Ask those people. They got rid of him. Look what happened to them. So what I'm saying is, this, that is really a sick mind that can sit there and say, let's just get rid of Yahweh in our life because he's the God of suffering. No. We suffer because of sin. That's what is happening. Do what? Well, you can get a mic. You can throw one in. It's not only sin. No, I, I know that. I'm not, we're not talking about sickness. I'm talking about when judgment comes because of sin. Look, because I do know, look, this is what she was saying. We do go through times where we get sick. We get sick. Sometimes it may be out of judgment. It doesn't mean it's out of judgment all the time. I'm not saying that. Sometimes it is, but sometimes that's not. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when, like Sodom and Gomorrah, they wasn't, they didn't, he didn't hit them with sickness. He brought hellfire down on them. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about judgment in that form and fashion and revelation whenever he's going to bring, when Yeshua comes back with his angels, that's what I'm talking about. You're going to see that out of the altar judgments, let's just put them that way, because I definitely don't want to condemn anybody thinking because they're not feeling well that that's a judgment from God. Sometimes it can be, sometimes it's not. But what I'm saying is, is this, is that when somebody makes a statement that we need to get God out of this country, I'm just telling you, you're not going to be blessed with that, okay? That's just not going to work. not going to happen. But this is what he tells us. That we are to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priest. See, here's the problem. When he's created everyone. He put man in the garden to serve him. And even though he gets kicked out, that don't mean that the mandate's changed. The mandate's still the same. If you're going to live on this earth that he created, this is his place in the fullness thereof. And so with that, it says that he created, he consecrated, he set them apart to serve him as priest. And that's what our job is. And then he said that you take one bull of the herd, two rams without blemish. Verse 2, and unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil. And I looked this up, and this is usually, almost always, olive oil is what they mix this with. Unleavened wafers smeared with oil. See, we are to be unleavened cakes smeared with olive oil. You shall make them of fine wheat flour. Can I ask you a question? How do you get fine wheat flour? Does it grow? I mean, it just comes right out of the ground, and it's fine wheat. You, no, that's what you got to sift it. You got to you got to crush it. Do you have to crush it? Yes. It become you got to work it. You got to crush it. Then it becomes fine. See, what am I saying? Every one of us to say, I want to be fine wheat flour. But I promise you, you don't want to go through the process to get there. That's where I'm at. See, Yeshua is our example. He went through this. He is our unleavened bread because sin in this case of Passover, not in all cases, but in this case of Passover. Leaven, yeast, and all of that represents sin. And sin is what puffs us up. It, it, it interferes with the process of being unleavened. So Yahweh is saying that he's consecrating the priest. He has a protocol of what he's doing. So he's saying that now there's going to be unleavened bread. And it's to be of fine wheat flour. That ought to tell us. But what about oil? Does oil just pour off of a tree? Oh, yeah, it's got to go through crushing too. To be able to use the fine flour and to be able, because we talked about last night, Tammy brought it up, because they were standing ready to go, they took that process and they made that bread, but then the sun had to do what? It had to bake it, had to bake it. So there's heat that's implied or applied to our lives but the heat is applied to our lives to make us in the image of Him. It's to burn out anything that's not supposed to be there. And it is to, and like I say, we're not to be half-baked. In other words, we need to be whole-baked people. We need to be a good. But now let me say this. Unleavened bread is not an apple fritter. Okay? 
But what does it say in Proverbs about sin? It says whenever you eat it, it's sweet to the taste, right? But it's bitter to the stomach. That's what sin does. Sin is sweet to the taste. Unleavened bread, unless you put some peanut butter on it, or unless you put some honey on it, unless you doctor it, it's not sweet. But what happens is, is there again, we need to be satisfied with what Yahweh gives us and to be able to do and eat because He knows best. But what do we do? We get to where we're not satisfied. with. Look, let me just say this. Last night, I had a piece of, I haven't eaten sugar in 10 weeks, 13 weeks or something. And I ate a lemon delight last night. And when that lemon delight, when it passed the taste buds, there was a party going on (laughs) in my mouth. There was disco balls going out of my eyes. And my taste buds was like, where has this been for the last... 13 weeks. So I'm telling you, no, it's, yeah, Tammy said, yeah, you can do it. But it, yeah, because it we're celebration, but it ain't today. But what I'm saying is, is sweetness. Look, guys, we enjoy things that are sweet. We enjoy things that taste good. We enjoy things that feel good. But the Yah- Yahweh knows what our diet should consist of, is all I'm saying. So I'm just letting you know something about this unleavened bread. It wasn't the most savory piece of morsel on the planet. But yet he asked us to do this. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 2 1. Leviticus 2 1. This should be a picture of our lives. When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to Yahweh, do you know that we're never supposed to come before Yahweh empty handed? His offering shall be of, again, Fine flour. It means that it's been worked. It's been crushed. It's been sifted. It's ready to be used. And he shall pour oil, which has been crushed and on it. But here it says he put frankincense on it. So now here, you're something added to it. It's supposed to give it a sweet aroma for him. So we're to be fine flour. Yeshua was mixed with oil. We're going to talk about the oil a little bit later, but also the fragrance, because this is one thing that the Father mentioned to us at Rosh Kadesh, that we should be that sweet aroma to people to be able to minister Him. Look, guys, I I think this is what's happened. I mean, I I grew up in youth groups, and I grew up in all that stuff. What happens in the world today is programs and gimmicks and pick up basketball and all of these things that they do to try to get someone to come to church. Yahweh's trying to tell us, if my word is not good enough to get you to come to church, your basketball and all of the things and the gimmicks and all of that things, all the things that you do. I mean, look, when we have to get to where we have to sanctify Halloween to get people to come to church to try to keep them from going out, there's a problem there. There's a heart issue, and what we keep doing is, is we keep putting methylate on everything. We keep putting neosporin. We keep trying to doctor it with medicine when the pure word will do, because the pure word is life in it. It is, and, and that's what an unleavened, I mean, we, this mixture, only time you see a mixture good is right here, is when you have fine flour and the oil and the salt and the frankincense and those things that go in here to make this bread. Verse 2, it says, And bring it to Aaron's son, the priest, and they shall take it from it, a handful of fine flour and oil. And I'm just reading this because I just wanted to just, I'm really trying to get it in your mind about fine flour, unleavened bread, oil, frankincense. The priest shall burn it as a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma. Because Yahweh, who says it's pleasing? Yahweh does. And this is why we do it. It does it. He doesn't ask us to add any ingredient to this. He doesn't ask us to add any any ingredient other than the Torah and the Holy Spirit in our life. We have Yeshua. That transforms. But what do we try to do is, is we try when we start trying to mix religions, this is what we go back to the book of Revelation and these congregations. That's what they were doing. They were mixing all these gods. They were mixing things to satisfy the flesh. 
all of these fertility gods and all of that because that's what it fed was the flesh. And he's telling us that if you do it my way, you will be a sweet aroma to the people. You can't be a sweet aroma if we're doing the same thing the world's doing because they can smell it. They smell you no different than they are. Why do they need Yeshua? Because they can smell it. And a lot of times, what does sin do? It gives us sinuses. It just clogs up our sniffer. We can't smell. So think about it. <clears throat> okay, uh, verse 4. No, verse 3. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, and it is the most holy part. Yahweh, it is Yahweh's food offering. When you bring the grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves, fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers. Let's look at verse 6. And then what happens to it? You shall what? Break it into pieces. Pour oil on it, for it is a grain offering. Does this look a lot like Yeshua? Right there at this, what we talked about at Passover last night, how he was broken. And then he said, this is my body. This bread represents my body, which is what? Broken for you. Everything is, is back here and all. And I know we go through the Torah portions and most of us know this. But it's important that we, we visit this and understand that this breakingness, I mean, this brokenness that he had was because he was suffering for righteousness. He wasn't suffering for unrighteousness. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Now, as you're going to 16 in John 12, if we remember six days before the Passover, there was a young lady named Mary, and she broke forth a bottle, and she was anointing Yeshua's feet. And anointing him with what? with nard or with the oil or frankincense type smell. It might not have been frankincense, but it was an aroma. So what I'm saying here is this, is it was said that this was for his burial, but, but you also see that there's an aroma happening because in that aroma, because there's so many scriptures, I can't get to all of them, but I wanted to let you know if you remember the story because the, the aroma filled the room. And then because you know what happened when somebody's not in sync with Yahweh, what does he do? You shouldn't have done this. You should have sold it and give it to the poor. You're not concerned with the poor. You're fixing to turn him in. You know? So Yeshua told him, leave this woman alone. Okay, chapter 16, verse 3. It says, you shall eat no unleavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread. Talking about the feast of unleavened. Because this is the bread of affliction. Because this is what it says, the bread of affliction. What is it? It's about Isaiah 53. This is to show forth about Yeshua. This is what this was all about. Because he was that bread of affliction for us. And sometimes we're going to have to be it for our neighbor. Or we may have to be it for our people. It says, you came out from the land of Egypt in haste. That all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. So this is why we retell this story over and over and over again in these seasons. Because every year, hopefully and prayerfully, we'll get something new. It will move us forward one degree. It says, no leaven is seen among you in all your territories for seven days. Nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice and even on the first day remain all night until morning. Now... 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go there real quick. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Paul said this, and he's relaying it back to Deuteronomy and also the blessings and also this feast of unleavened bread. It says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven... That you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. See, it shows us that we're really to be an unleavened people. But how do you get to be, even if you're, believe it or not, to be bread. Can I just say this? To be bread, you're going to have to be crushed. Whether you're leavened or not. 
Okay, you're just going to be crushed. There's not the process, and in, in like that guy was saying, you need to get rid of God so that you're going to get rid of suffering. I don't know what he was drinking, smoking, or both. That ain't going to happen. And him being a Jew should know more than anybody in this world that the reason why the children of Israel, I mean, it was, it was a blessing to be able to bring them out of the land of Egypt and bless them and then even take them into the promised land after all the grumbling and complaining and the fighting and the bickering. Finally, they got in there, but they didn't hold that because they were, they were in sin. They were still mixing and what does it say about the land? Look, can I just say this too? Everything that we've been talking about, salt, talking about oil, talking about bread, talking about everything that grows, where does it come from? The land. It comes from the land. The land is connected all through this. He blesses us with the land and all of the above, but yet sin and not being obedient to him is what got him kicked out of the land. But he's telling us this. Cleanse out the old leaven that you'd be a new lump. For you're really unleavened. This is what we're supposed to be. Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. This is the great news. Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil. And this is what we've been talking about before we got to this place. If there's malice and evil and there's works of the flesh that's in our life, that's leaven. And that's a leaven life and we need to get rid of that. But he says, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Because that's Yahweh's way. Or right, let's go to Luke 22. Remember in the beginning now, we talked about a garden. Yahweh placed in Genesis 2.8, said I planted a garden and there I put a man in it. I really, I've noticed this before, but it's been a while. Our Jewish brothers, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, all the people that lived in Yeshua's day. He's sitting here producing signs like nobody's business. Lepers being healed, not ever been done, as far as what I know of, of, of these things. Blind people's eyes opening. You see Lazarus and people being raised from the dead. You, you're seeing demons we're and we're talking about children. We're talking about people that were born this way. We're, we're just talking about all of this stuff happening. Now, I'm telling you that during that day that Yeshua walked, there was a great stir about him. There was a stir about him. They did Because you always see them trying to catch him in something. So if he wasn't a big issue, they wouldn't be all the time trying to catch him in something. You know, here's Caesar's. What do you pay taxes? What do you, you're you always trying to trap him into something. And then they come up with this crazy thought, well, show us a sign. I'm like, dude, where y'all been? I mean, I'm sitting here reading of all the things that Yeshua has done. I mean, going back to when he was 12, when he's sitting in here confounding the rabbis in the temple and, and teaching <laughs> like wow and you see all of these things happen and, and you know that all of the stuff that we have this recorded can I tell you that there's much more there's much more there's many more miracles that happen turning water into wine at a wedding doing all of these things I hadn't seen it done I, I mean I, I know I know a guy got pulled over one time and he was drunk, and he said, you know, Yeshua did it again. He turned the water into wine. So that's what he tried to tell the cop. That didn't work. You know what I'm saying? So don't try that. It won't work. But think about all of, the, and all of these signs that he did. All of these signs that he did. And then they're coming down to the end. Show us a sign. But then he has to tell them, I'm going to show you a sign. But you know what? I'm going to show you this sign, and it's going to come to pass, and you're still not going to believe it. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. And you know what? You're not going to believe that either, even when he's raised up. 
you're going to concoct some kind of story to try to cover up your tracks. Because your heart is evil and your heart is full of leaven. But I thought about something here. I believe this is another tie-in. In verse 18, I mean chapter 18, verse 1 in John, it says, When Yeshua had spoken these words, He went out with His disciples across the brook Kidron. All right. What you have is, as I've been there, the Mount of Olives. You look down the valley. There's the Kidron Valley. And then it goes back up and you have Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. And that's where Jerusalem is. And you can see this. And this is where he was at. He's at the Mount of Olives. Now, how many, you know, in old days, we've always heard that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, there is no Garden of Gethsemane. There's a garden where there's a Gat Shemim. A Gat Shemim is a wine press. This is where Yeshua would go. Remember, everybody, because Yeshua didn't live in Jerusalem. He lived in the Galilee. That's right. It's Olive Press. Yeah, Gat Shemim, Olive Press. So what happens is, is they would travel and they would have to find places to stay. Sort of like maybe when he was born and there was no place in the inn and he was born in a manger. You have this. Well, if you go there in the Mount of Olives, they have these, they have these olive press and they have these caves where these olive presses are. And you would go in there and since, since we're in the spring, they don't have olives in the spring. That's going to be in the fall. So they would use that to house the people to come in. Look, it's nice and cool in there. It's, it's a nice place. But you have an olive press and now... Yeshua, we're talking about bringing an offering, unleavened bread and olives, and it was olive oil. Now he's at the Mount of Olives. Now he's at a place where it's a Gat Shemin. He's at a place where there's an olive crusher or an olive press. And it's going to press all of that stuff out. And it's a garden. And I said a garden. So now we're talking unleavened life, unleavened bread, because this is that time and season of Passover. Now he's staying, not only on the Mount of Olives, but where there is actually an olive press and where all of that process was going on, in a garden. And where was man placed? In a garden. Anybody want a sign? Knock me over with it. Now, verse 2, Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. Why did he know the place? Because Yeshua often met there with his disciples. Because that's where they would go every feast. They would travel there. Or let's go to Luke 22. Verse 39. Look at this picture. Yeshua is there on that night. He says, and he came out and he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. So it tells you where he was at. And the disciples followed him, as they usually would do. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And when he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. We talked about that cup last night. The one that we didn't drink, but the one that he drank for us. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Guys, this next verse is important. You need to grab this next verse, and you need to memorize it. You need to hold on to it. When he was going through his darkest hour, it says, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Yahweh didn't leave him. Yahweh was with him the whole time. He was in that garden. He went through the supper. He went through everything. He was with him the whole time. Even in his darkest hours as he's crying out, Yahweh never leaves us or forsakes us. Even though we think that we're in our darkest times, he's there. And if he can't send an individual to comfort, he'll send an angel. I'm telling you, He'll send His Spirit. He'll send a word. He'll send His Torah. He'll send you a scripture. He'll send you something to strengthen us. He gives us that. When you're crying out, Mark, when you was in there, and you're crying out, He sent your brother. When he would say uh, that song, there's a time of strengthening that happens. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. Now, I'm telling you, I've not been where you were at. 
or where Tom was at. I hadn't been there where Herman's at. I hadn't been there. I don't desire to go there. But I can tell you that when you're in these places, a lot of times you probably feel alone. You probably feel like he's forsaken me. He's not there. He's not here. And then a lot of times in our very darkest hours, he shows up. He shows up in a powerful way to give us another ray of hope to be able to go that next degree. It's amazing. He never leaves us or forsakes us, and he didn't his son. Think about the olive press. Think about what the olive press does. Think about our sins. Our sins, the sins of the whole world, is probably the heaviest stone that's ever been in mankind. And yet you understand that whenever they would press these olives to get the oil out, it took a very heavy stone. And it took a lot of pressure and grinding to get the, get the oil out of there. Now when I read this verse, you got to understand that our sins did this to Him. The very weight, we were a stone to Him. We were a stone, our sins were a stone to Him. It says, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Can you see the squeezing? Can you see the anguish and the squeezing and all of that that is happening to him? For the weight of the world's sin is upon him to where the agony is caused evidently his pores to open up to a place to where there's even the drops of blood that would be coming out. Let's go to John. We're going to finish up here. John. Okay, John 19. I'm sorry, John 19. Okay, 39 to 42. Now, Nicodemus also, who earlier came, who had come to Yeshua by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe. About 75 pounds in weight. Now, guys, that's a lot. 75 pounds is a lot. You're going to bring a lot of myrrh and, and uh, aloe. That's, that's a lot. So they took the body of Yeshua and they bound it in linen clothes with the spices as the burial custom of the Jews. Listen to this. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a what? A garden. And in the garden, there's a new tomb in which no one had laid in it. I thought, how fitting, in verse 40, 41 of 19, how fitting how he placed us in a garden, sin kicked us out of the garden, and here he's crucified outside of a garden, and he's buried in a garden. And he's going to be resurrected in a garden to take us back to the garden. You can't get any clearer than that as a sign. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was closed at hand, there they lay, or there laid Yeshua there. In Luke 24, I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to tell you this. This was his resurrection. This is when the, they went there. They saw that the tomb was rolled away. They saw what they thought were two men standing there in dazzling apparel. That ought to show them something. Tammy's excited because there is bling bling in heaven. <laughs> but yet they were frightened and they bowed their faces. And yet these, these two angels, why are you looking? Or why do you seek the living from among the dead? Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? Why are you seeking the living among the dead? In verse 6, he said, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. And then it says, in verse 8, it says, and 
it enlightened their minds and it said, and they remembered His words. Guys, we need to always remember His words. As we get ready in, in this life, no matter what happens, this is what we were talking about at the last, they call it the Last Supper. I don't know what to call it. You know that time where they were having that meal and He was teaching them. Trying to show them that their world was fixing to be rocked. My thing is, is for us, and I've said that here many times, we've not really been in a place, for the most part, there's a, there has been a handful in this congregation, I'm telling you, that's been in a place where your world's been rocked. I'm not saying that. It has been. There's no doubt. It's a scary place to be. This is why community is so important. This is why family is so important. Because when your world is rocked, a lot of times you don't want to see, talk, you don't want to have anything. You just need what you think you need is space. And sometimes we have to give space. But you never stop praying for that individual because once that time, whether it's us or whether it's an angel that's sent to him, Yahweh never leaves us or forsakes us. So I'm seeing in this story, and I just wanted in my portion of unleavened bread is to know that suffering for righteousness sake, we need to embrace that and be grateful for that because that is going to, I mean, the very things that you do was going to lay up treasures in heaven or lay up treasures in the world to come for us to be able to have some resources from. Leavened bread, unleavened bread, I mean, fine flour, crushing. Oil, crushing. Our sins on Yeshua, crushing. So, that's right, salt granulars are crushed to be able to be used. You can see this happen. So what I'm saying is, is we ought not be a people that would fear to be unleavened. We need to be excited and embrace it because it's the, it's the very source of right. This is, this is what was used to consecrate the priest and to set them apart. So our lives to be this way is setting our lives. Being here at Unleavened Bread, not having leaven in your house, eating unleavened bread all week, is a set-apart commandment. It sets you apart to Him. And He will bless you in that. He promises that He will. So like I said before, a man was placed in the garden, man sinned in a garden, man got kicked out of a garden. Yeshua, the Son of Man, prayed in a garden, was betrayed in a garden, crucified outside of a garden, buried in a garden, resurrected in a garden, and guess what, guys? And after the returns, the second resurrection, he's going to take us back to a garden. Amen. And guys, you can't get a better sign than that of how the first Adam and the last Adam has come full circle during this time. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do just thank you for this portion. And we thank you for the hope of the resurrection. We thank you, Father, for your blessings in this day and in these feasts. And Father, as we, I mean, everything that you have speaks to us uh, about the consecration of the priest. We are a priesthood, a separated people, Father, according to Peter, a holy generation. Father, a holy people. Holy just means kadosh, meaning to be set apart for you, to serve you and to worship you. And Father, as we continue in this day to serve and worship you, and not only today, in this whole week, every day is important. Not just today at the first day and the last day of unleavened bread. Every day we eat matzah. Every day that we have unleavened bread. It should remind us of who you are, of who your son Yeshua is, and who we are in you. And Father, that you have loved us, and there's a reason for this season. And I pray, Father, that each one of us, in this time of where we're at in our growth pattern, that, Father, that you would just pull a revelation to us or put that revelation to us and we would understand how we are to be stewards and servants in your kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Okay, amen. Thank you, guys. The, it's an awesome time, too. This day represents the day that he led them out of Egypt. Amen. And that it was by a high hand which uh, Shirley's been talking about, they, the Egyptians, I mean, they're like, take our stuff and get out of here. They plundered them, and it was them wanting to give it away to get them out of there because they knew whose Elohim had come on the scene and who defeated all the gods of Egypt. 
all the way to the Red Sea, which would be the last great day that we'll talk about it. So let's walk in the freedom and the deliverance that he has given us. Amen. There is much to celebrate. It is Passover, a time to remember the dramatic culmination of the divine miracles that led to the great exodus from slavery in Egypt. The desert days are now a distant memory. The children of Israel have been the singular object of God's provision and protection. It is a time for thanksgiving. It is a time for praise. It is a time to bring sacrifices before the Lord. It is a time to remember His goodness. Hallelujah. Sing praises to Jehovah.
together. Sound the great shofar for our freedom. Raise the banner to gather our exiles and gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Praised are you, O Yahweh, who gathers in the dispersed of your people, Israel. Amen, amen. Let's pray for the United States of America. Abba, Father, giver of life, we pray for and entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock on which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of life, liberty, and blessings. We cry out for this land to be reclaimed for your glory. May it be that you will dwell among your people. Send your spirit to touch and open the hearts of our nation and its leaders to seek your will and your ways. Grant us the ability and courage to stand for the truth, and may we be that righteous nation you have called us to be. We ask this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, all together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up even the tribes of Yahweh, an ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of Yahweh, for there thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of Yahweh our Elohim, I will seek your good. The ironic benediction. Ivareka Kadonai, Vishmareka, Yahir Adonai Panavaleka Vikuneka, Isa Adonai Panavaleka, Vayosem Leka Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. Amen. May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you shalom of peace. Amen. And it's time again for the Kiddush, the blessing over the wine. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagafin. Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and forgiving us, Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And the blessing over the matzah. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzelechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. It is Shabbat, thank the Lord. It is Shabbat, 